All right, all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a whole new episode of the Age of AI podcast. And today I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, self flattery. You know, one thing that I've always been um, proud of about hosting the show is that I've always tried to bring to you a very global outlook, right? My friend, my guests are from many different countries, you know, Europe, Asia, North America, you name it. And because I have guests from all over the world, I also get to hear so many different accents of English. Uh, and over time, I've become a little desensitized to it. You know, I notice people's accents, but in general, I can pretty much focus mainly on the words they're saying. And I don't really like I basically tune out the accents because I've been traveling and I've been working with people like for a long time. But I've recently been reminded of the, the fact that most people are actually not like that. This is not true for most people, including myself. When I first started out, uh, when I was in, I think when I was in school, if I ever heard an American talk or a British person talk, I, had, I would have no idea what they were saying. Even though I understand English, I can really, I can read English and I can write English really well. And the same goes vice versa. You know, we... If you hear someone with a very thick accent, which is different from yours, it not only makes communication difficult, but it also evokes many biases and stereotypes, right? Like you hear Americans go rah-rah over the British accent, like, oh my God, so sophisticated, looks so fancy, you know? I love the British accent. Uh, and of course, everybody makes fun of the Indian accent, but we won't, we won't talk about that too much today. But uh, this is a really big problem. and. Of course, as you already know, because you clicked on this episode, here comes machine learning AI to the rescue. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce to you my new guest, Ghana Timko. Is that is that the right pronunciation of your name? Yeah, this is perfectly good. Uh, my name is Ghana Timko. I'm a CEO and founder of uh, Seso. Yeah, she's the founder of Seso, uh, which is a really wonderful company. And Seso is building a system which can plug into any voice input software whether it's like a video conferencing tool or something else and it can in real time transform your accent right and so in this episode although the the pitch is pretty simple you get it you understand the, the, it's a big problem and you can understand you know what the product does just by this one simple sentence right Today, you'll get a mini masterclass of sorts in AI product management, because that's the thing that is truly unique, which is how do you, how do you actually go about building a product which has so many sensitive cultural layers to it, right? Uh, which is, it's not just like something that you're solving a little technical problem. It's actually solving a very human problem using the most technical means possible. And so once again, thank you so much, Ghana. My first question to you would be, which is your favorite accent in English? <laughs> this is such an interesting question. Which is my favorite accent? Huh. I, I haven't thought of this one. It's, it's, uh, I think probably actually my favorite accent is Polish accent. <laughs> okay. Polish, Polish English. Accent. All right. Because I you know Polish is my first language okay. and I'm, I'm actually always very sentimental when I hear somebody talking uh, with Polish English accent, it reminds me of home. And it reminds me very much about my early days of my career where I started working um, in international settings. And then, you know, lots of people started over also quite young in their careers, not so proficient. And we were all like, go, you know, just scrambling to get by with our. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, it brings nice memories. Nice, nice. We did have, uh, I think the last guest that we had was a Polish person. So, you know, yeah, check out the podcast if you want to listen it's to a... more Polish English accents. <laughs> okay, I will. It's a, it's a, it's a streak. You're on a streak of <laughs> getting Polish uh, <laughs> presenters, Polish guests. Yeah, for sure. That that was always the intention, you know. Okay, so let's talk about the product management journey. So, when you first had this idea that okay, this is a problem, like people don't, you know, like accents or they don't get accents. Let's start there. What happened? Mm -hmm. 
So I I want to say a couple of words about say so, and I'm gonna and, I'm, and then I'm gonna tell you about my journey, how uh, how say so came about, and how accent problem came about. So at, at say so, our goal is to make delightful speech experiences, uh, and and we want to help people communicate clearly with each other and technology, so they can communicate clearly and understand each other with ease. And then the first beachhead product that we are building that we are just about to release is a real-time accent transformation mm -hmm. and i started this um, actually quite uh interestingly because i had personal problem in my life i was working for one of the very large technical companies here in silicon valley and i was uh, engaging with international teams uh, across the globe uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, from from somewhere else not from the us not from poland uh, and, and you know people had difficulty understanding me mm. and i had really hard time understanding my colleagues I, I have particularly bad ear for australian english and new zealand english like uh -huh. i i really struggle to make sense of it and then you know <laughs> i thought hey we we all speak the same language those people are native speakers i i spent 20 years learning english yeah. But we cannot understand each other. Like we we need to solve this problem. Uh, and I and I went on like going to the design and going to product management. Before I started building anything, I went on to understand what is people's situation with accent. Yeah. So I asked. I started asking my colleagues, "Hey, like, how do you experience accent? Mm -hmm. Is it a problem for you? How it impacts your professional personal situation?" And if you were to think about technical solution to that, what would this solution be? And I had those very open ended conversations. I was not pointing people towards any direction. Um, I, what I heard from people that they had very difficult situation with accent. Accentism, unfortunately, is alive and well. Uh, there are strong biases. Uh, some people told me they feel like they are miss missing out on opportunities of promotion or, or um, professional advancement. Some people told me that uh, when they try to apply for a job, they, they talk to headhunter, not even hiring manager, and they get dismissed just because of the way they speak. They don't mm -hmm. get a chance to talk to somebody. And, I, and, then, and from native speakers working on international teams, I heard very uh also strong problem statement because they they told me that uh some people told me that with international teams they they spend a lot of time actually avoiding live conversations uh mm. that they would use slack messages and they would use like emails to communicate with each other so they can read and clearly understand and then on team meetings sometimes uh people would have to go through notes and they would try to capture meeting notes and they spend extra time reading through this and some things would not be captured very well because speech recognition is not very good with accents mm. so they would still have a big question mark they will need to follow up and that people are really dreading it uh so i heard this like really big problem statement and then for people who are non-native speakers, they were thinking of changing their own speech. They told me, mm. they gave me a couple of design requirements, basically. So they mm. asked me that solution, if there were a solution technologically, it would have to be something that is a real-time solution that mm. they can use during calls. There is no lag or delay. Also, they said that if it's a teleconferencing video call, they want to have their lips synced with their voice, so they mm. don't want to be strange. People told me they that accent is quite an important part of their identity and personality, and they don't want to sound all standardized. Uh, they want to just be more clear and intelligible. So they want to preserve some of their identity. They want mm. to, ability, uh, to have ability to dial this up or dial down because um, mm. you know they wanted to have a say on how, how their speech has been changed. They also told me they very much don't like to sound like Siri or Alexa. So they, uh. they didn't want to sound robotic. Yeah. So they, they cared about human conversation. And also people told me that they want to have some ability to signal to their counterpart, to the people they're talking with, that they're using some, some technique, technology to alter their speech. So when they meet face to face, there is no shock that their speech is very different on, on the call from Ooh, speech okay. and life situation. Interesting. So I, I, I took all of those things as, as design requirements and I actually ran with it. And uh, that was kind of origin of, of 
design requirements for our product. And actually we're meeting all of those requirements right now. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting uh, what you said that at least two of those requirements are somewhat like a tug of war, right? Uh, one of them is that you do want to sound intelligible uh, and uh, you do want to, you do have a problem with accent. So you want to, you know, fix it change. or whatever, like change yeah. it or whatever you call it. Right. Um, and on the other hand, you not only want to retain some of your identity, right. Which is a way of saying that you don't want to have a very thick foreign accent, uh, yeah. as well as you also, I think it's kind of an extension of the same requirement, which is that you want people to feel that you are using a technique. So it's like you want, people to notice that you're being a little bit robotic, but not too much, just a little bit foreign, but not too much. So there's a lot of like subjective tuning on the part of people. So they, it's ultimately making, making it a very, instead of making it like a discrete solution, what they really want is that they want a lot of control over exactly how thick the accent is and how robotic or unrobotic um, their voice sounds. So is that, is it two different problems to say the thickness of the accent and the um, the and how robotic you sound, or are they different phases of the exact same problem? No, so I want to clarify a little bit. So yeah. uh, the the technology that we are building will actually uh, is preserves p people's voice and intonation, yeah. and it's it changes their accent, and it can be and the, and. In first iteration, we're doing a mild accent conversion. In further iterations, we will enable users to choose if they want to do more severe, like harder accent conversion um, or not. And mm -hmm. you know, for people who are using it for their own speech, maybe like it, it seems like mild version is 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 very desirable. For people who are using it to alter their colleagues or customers, uh, they 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 might want to have a very strong alteration so they you know like they have a very clear understanding mm -hmm. of what the person is saying it's it's very close to what their brain understands the easiest way so uh in the, in the you know there is no really a tug of war between sounding robotic because the, the technology itself should not make you sound robotic yeah uh what we have right now is not fully perfect so it cuts off some frequencies of speech so there is there is some uh some element of robotic that actually it's not going to be there when we launch it for for people so i, I guess this is honest. what you're referring to <laughs> yes no it's you know we are very hard tech startups there is a real technology there and real innovation and there are patents behind it uh it it takes time to develop technology it takes time to develop speech technology and innovation yep takes multiple alteration and you know to some degree the process is actually never perfect so if you look at standards across the board if you look at uh speech recognition for example it, those products are around for 10 plus years and they're still being like perfected mm -hmm. and uh, developed further and I, I think this will be the case with say so the work is never done but you can on, you, you kind of aim to better and better mm -hmm. standards as you go along yeah um while you try to deliver value in, in what you offer, you know, what you release like. So I, I don't know if it answers the question. I hope I so, uh, got so, yeah, some of it. From a, that it, it, it kind of answers from uh, one aspect and uh, the other uh -huh. aspect is from a technical perspective. Uh, so, what you, so what you basically said is that it doesn't actually make people sound like they're actually using at least in the first iteration uh because you had to kind of prioritize the different design requirements right where yes, if yes. people like if somebody says oh i want to have an accent but i still want them to feel like i am using some like some technology to hide my accent like that's probably a less less low on the priority list than saying hey i want to sound intelligible um you know i want to sound clear to my co-workers to my customers so yeah so improving intelligibility is our like a very bottom line goal so like whatever we do the north star is for people to have easier time to communicate with each other so they yeah. can speak clearly and understand each other with ease 
and that th this is like a north star for anything the, any, any effort and um you know because it it creates productivity gains so save time reduced frustration improved collaboration and creativity also uh improved access to opportunity and effort mobility for some population when, so, mm -hmm. so it, when we improve intelligibility we go towards all of those goals and then like adding uh adding gears for people to dial up or dial down like fiddle with like their sound it it's it's extra feature it's something that they want to have and we will provide it for them so we will provide those features that this can be integrated in in software solutions but it's 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 less of a priority than intelligibility improvement Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. I think that's a good lesson, which is that, you know, uh, and I think this is something that differentiates a lot of like AI research projects from real world applications, which is that a lot of people who are building AI projects, they tend to come from research backgrounds or whatever. And uh, they start with a big hairy problem, which is good, you know, because that's what that's what moves the field forward. But we have to realize that when we are building a product, that uses AI, you know, it's first a product and then AI, right? The AI stuff has to happen within the context of solving the problem that you're trying to solve in the first place. And AI is just a tool uh, and you have to use the tool in a way that fits the problem, not like to changing the problem so that it fits uh, your research aspirations or, you know, whatever you want to build, right? Uh, that's, I think, yeah. a really great lesson here. Yeah, so I, I, I can elaborate a bit on that because I love science and I love scientific projects and I, I really love hard tech. But you know, like the difference between doing research and doing product is, is it's it's a huge, huge difference in, in attitude and what you do. Because when you do research, you do it to satisfy intellectual curiosity or to answer like some problem. And then you start working on it and it takes you different directions. Your curiosity always shifts also with what you find and what you discover. So you kind of flow like in the ocean and natural forces push you left to right, forward or backward. And then, you know, discoveries are made this way. Uh, usually it's it's a lengthy process of doing scientific discovery, it takes years. <laughs> yeah. with, with, you know, with be, being a startup, being a commercial entity, you don't have luxury of having all time in the world. Or you don't have unlimited funding. And when you're building a product, you have to keep a really strong focus on what you build, who you're building for and how they will use it. And then like, maybe for some listeners, it will be very obvious. Uh, it's but maybe for some, it will not be very obvious, but like when you're doing something, when you're making design decisions and when you're making like pivot decisions or where you want to shift your research, you have to check always with your customers to be so like, honestly, you have to talk to your customers like once a day, like, if, mm. if you're an entrepreneur, try to make a goal of talking to like one new customer once a day. And like, you have to interview them. Like you have to really have curiosity as, as much as in scientific inquiry, you have to have curiosity about your user and your, 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 your customer, you know, like what are their problems? What are they struggling with? Like don't come with, with, um, some, any assumptions to this, this conversation, like try to understand how you can be helpful, how your product can be helpful. And sometimes like very simple features that you would think are useless or like are not so attractive to you are actually some features that users really want and need. Hmm. And it's easy to miss on that if you don't talk to them, but, but you know, talking to people, talking to users, talking to customers, give, gives companies and founders like a huge advantage when the products are complete because they already, you know, have some natural product market fit or conceptual product market fit. And then they see customers coming to their doors and wanting to buy. And, and this is what we experience actually with say, so we have a lot of very organic uh, interest and, you know, we don't even have search engine optimization, we spent like, like really, we don't have like word optimization. We like don't have any adwords or any advertising, no social media, like very small profile on LinkedIn. And yet we have like really big and small companies coming to our door, wanting to do business or being curious and interested in us. Um, so so we, ha we also had very organic TechCrunch article about us. Mm. It's, you know, but, but this is all, this is happening when you try to build something that people need and would love. And yeah. then like it, it, it creates natural interest. It creates much better business success. And frankly, you have to fund your research. So unless you are a governmental institution, you're somewhere in academia, you have like access to grants, 
give you in a good place. But if you're a commercial entity, you have to fund your research that is like so tremendously expensive. You you better make sure that you're building product that people want. You know, yeah. If, if you want to survive and stick around, yeah, like it's 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 quite important. Yeah. So from a you know from a technical perspective, talk to us about how the technology itself evolved. Of course, you know you have some things that you that IP which you can't share. Uh, but in general, in terms of just educating the audience about a solution like this, you know, so we can again move the field forward. What was the process of actually solving the problem once you had the design requirements and everything? Yeah, so you know, I have I have a background in IT, so I I studied IT. I have undergrad in IT, and that was quite generic, but it gave me opportunity to understand uh, what is happening in in uh, technology and read papers and understand state of the art and yeah. like, like research to my uh, you know like to my own advantage and my understanding. So I had design requirements where I wanted to create real-time technology that transforms speech. I wanted to have people's voices and intonation preserved. Mm. And I, I didn't want to sound uh, to have it sound robotic. So I, was, I, I realized very fast that I'm looking to create technology that didn't exist because mm. I couldn't rely on natural language processing because whatever happens with natural language processing, you would have to synthesize speech on the other output of, like on the other side of this, yeah. which would not sound natural. It would sound, maybe it would sound okay. So AI is getting better, but it would not be original emotional conversation yeah. and people will have no uh, impact on how they sound on the other yeah. side of it. And we knew it's not, it's, it's no go. And then also it's questionable whether you can make things in real time with NLP and it, if if you were to try to do this, it would be very computationally heavy and probably not work on prem. Uh, so so I understood that. And then no, I was looking and, for. Uh, by the way, when uh -huh. you say on prem, just for anybody who's listening, on prem <laughs> means uh, on, on the premises, device. On, on the device. device of, like, uh, so like the there are some software that you can run on a you know gaming laptop with like with endless uh, RAM and endless graphic processing power, but running the same software on your phone if you're speaking to Siri or Alexa or something like that. Uh, you know, some things don't transfer well to small devices that big. So that's what he means by on-prem. Yeah. You know? That's a yeah, technical yeah. term right there. <laughs> yeah. So actually, like on mobile devices, you can do much more than on desktop devices. Like it, it, it was a shocker to me when I when I saw about it. Like oh. was reading about it, but like mobile devices have much more computational power than <laughs> lots of desktop devices. We, we wanted to do it on desktop devices because that was our first iteration to add it to teleconferencing software and call center software. So we wanted to do something also lightweight, and. You know, I came I came in with like very strong user requirements because I knew that if we create something that user wanted, users will buy. And I started interviewing potential candidates who could be like a technical lead or like CTO in my company and create technology. Mm -hmm. And they were telling me, "Hey, like this is a really nice dream, but this is impossible. Mm. Like we cannot build technology that is doing all of that." And then I was like, "Okay, I'm." I'm it was nice to meet you and yeah. thank you and, and <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> and you know, like it, I, I was, I was getting a lot of those conversations. Mm -hmm. I was, I also had somebody who was trying to put together a black box AI approach. So we throw like a really large amount of data on the problem. So we compare native and non-native speakers and we kind of try to achieve some result. And this approach was not working very well for us either. So that what was the approach just, again? Can you can you elaborate just a little bit on that approach? Yeah, so that was throwing like a lot of we took some parallel data from native and non-native speakers. So people saying same utterances, and then like we tried to teach AI to to alter speech so it sounds closer to the native speaker. Like what were like the what were the outputs? That was all in a sound wave output. So okay. we were just changing sound wave to sound wave. And that mm. was this, this was not working very well because there is like too much complexity. And also we needed like super huge amounts of data and parallel data is, is quite challenging in many ways. Right now you can use synthetic data, but as also synthetic data has problems uh, because it makes sound, things sound more synthetic and there is not much diversity in speaker. 
if you try to generate large volumes of synthetic data. Um, so, so, so if I understand correctly, the first approach was, okay, you want at the end a sound wave output, which has the person's words in the right accent and right everything, and that's the output of the model. And to do yeah. that, the approach that you were trying is to input the model with, um, with like what? What were the inputs? Yeah. So the inf so like the, so the training was to train the model on parallel utterances that are force aligned. So, okay. you know, force align it. So make the model understand what what this word sounds like in mm. if it's said by a native speaker. Mm -hmm. like this part of the speech and then you know ah like, so, i see yeah so take a word in one from one in one accent and then try to train the model to convert that particular word into to a sound different closer accent. to the different accent that's sound right. to that, the, so that was i yeah. see and then the speech would be built up word by word so each word would go in get translated into the different accent and then out comes the new word and you keep adding words to a yeah. sentence that was the yeah so we, we so yeah we did it on words so it didn't go very far because there are different words that sound similar so ship and ship and you know like yeah there are lots of things like that that get distorted but it was more of a test idea like well, how much data do we need and how how much effort do we need and how much control do we actually have on the output mm -hmm. and the 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 result of it was that we had like little control on how the output output is and then like if you retrain model it's it would sometimes produce like very different output uh it was hard to manage and navigate and, and obviously mm -hmm. it was slow so we could improve on doing making it faster like look at more granular parts of speech not at words but like th this this approach was a no-go okay and, uh yeah it, it, you know i was still looking for somebody else who could who could try to do it differently and then I, I I was interviewing a bunch of people. I posted on uh, Angel Co that I was looking for an uh, advisor. Actually, I was not looking for a founder mm -hmm. or CTO at that point. I was looking just like spreading the the word, who who can build something like this. And then uh, one my co-founder Bryce came about, and he said like, "Hey, I think I can do it." let me just go and show you and i really love as a founder i love when people say like let me just yeah. go and do it let me show you instead of like well you know like i need this and that like maybe if things align i will be able mm -hmm. to do something like but i'm busy right now like give me a couple of weeks I, I love when people come and say like hey like just let me go and show you and let me let, I'll, I'll try to do this i'm yeah. excited about this problem so like this was the beginning of actually my collaboration with Bryce and our current approach. Uh, he, he came back in two weeks or, so, or, or even faster, something like 10 days, maybe two weeks. And he had a proof of concept. Uh, he had a technology that was changing accent. Um, mm. The output of it was horrific. So it sounded like it was, it was very distorted. It sounded like Major Tom talking to you from space station that you can barely understand that it's speech, not a noise. Mm -hmm. But you could hear something that was happening to the accent. Uh, and this, this approach was real time compatible with what, which was more, most important. Yeah. And then, you know, as a founder, I got like super excited about it. So I was like, yeah, you can solve the problem of accent. Yay. You know? uh, then we built some other proof of concepts uh, based on parallel data. So we used the same approach, but then we, we did yes parallel can data again. can you explain that for the audience yeah so parallel data is when you take uh utterance uh from one speaker with say particular one particular accent and then you take exactly the same utterance uh with different accent mm. and what we did here so like to to reduce noises and reduce distortion what we did here like i found people who can produce Two different accents so i found accent actors mm. and i got them to record recordings exactly of the same words and same sentences in two different accents mm. so we had exactly same voices so the voice doesn't change and we mm -hmm. had like good quality clear recordings and we used this to to convert their speech from one accent to another so we trained model with this and then we used this speech so the model was very familiar but like mm. The, the what was the output of this sounded very very compelling and sounded very good and sounded actually close to, close to what our product sound 
sounds like right now after all of this like a year and a half of work on it mm -hmm. the difference between then and now is that we did like a fake uh experiment almost like a proof of concept and it was on parallel data and the data that system saw and knew and right now in we have something that is working real time on speakers it's never seen and doesn't know and mm. uh it doesn't require any you know like familiarity with the speaker so mm. uh, there was a big amount of work to be done between now and then yeah but um yeah it, it, it's it happened interesting so right. the ultimate so the ultimate uh what worked was uh there's multiple aspects to this first is you changed the outputs that you were looking for, right? Um, and then you change, of course, the model. And then by default, you had to change what kind of data you were looking for, uh, which was to have first the right, the same person speak two different sentences in two different accents, right? With the same yeah, voice. So we also you know i have to say because i told you about very simplistic black box approach where you yeah. throw a lot of data on the system and it changes accent what we're doing now the current approach we have is very different this approach is very precise and it's a mixture of digital signal processing and artificial intelligence and like if you want to do things in real time and you want to do things with low computational complexity so they can be done on user devices instead of on the cloud you have to be very, very precise uh, mm -hmm. in what you're doing because if if you're not, it will it will increase the computational complexity a lot, and it would in increase very much data requirements for input for technology to work. So what we're doing right now is is like a really like multi-module AI approach, and mm -hmm. uh, we do as much as we can on digital signal processing levels uh, with sound wave directly before we actually get any AI. To work in in this approach so like mm -hmm. there are there are multiple steps so like first is like recognizing what the person is saying like recognizing sounds of speech because we work on sounds of speech and very granular sounds of speech and then like when we recognize we can convert it and you know we, we split voice and intonation from actual sounds of speech of sounds of words mm -hmm. we convert those sounds of speech sounds of words to resemble more desired by our user accent. Mm. And then we recombine this with original voice and intonation of the speaker. So there are multiple operations here. And then like after we recombine, we still apply some filters and we still apply some post-processing to make the sound good, <laughs> to make yeah. it sound better. So there are like so many steps. Uh, maybe it sounds simple, but actually there is nothing simple about it. Uh, yeah, like it, it it's, pretty cool uh, as a research project it's a very cool research project uh, yeah so i think also give us, um, yeah. huh? so, so i think what you're what you're describing which i you know i'll try to summarize it for the uh, for the audience is um, the problem the way you're solving the problem at a high level is you take speech in a from a certain user you split mm -hmm. that piece you split that speech into different parts right one is the actual words that are being spoken, so the information in that speech. Mm -hmm. Then there is yeah. the voice and intonation of the person, yes. uh, which are again yes. two different things. There's voice and then there's intonation. And last is whatever we call the accent. And I think accent itself is a very complex thing. I don't know if people can really define what accent really means. Again. Maybe I can elaborate a little bit yeah. on how technology works and how yeah. we think about speech and how we think about accent. So. Sure. Um, you know, accent is just part of the speech and it's some some sound. So like we think of speech, which we process in a very organic way. So when we talk, the sound starts somewhere here, some somewhere in diaphragm. So pre pretty much deep in your vocal tract, like diaphragm mm -hmm. and larynx. Yeah. And this create your um, voice and this those parts of your body create your intonation so emotional int intent is coming from there mm. there, there is some you know and this is a relatively simple sound wave it, it has a simple shape ups and downs this sound wave is being passed to your upper vocal tract to your throat and your mouth mm. and your mouth shape and your mouth movement create sound of the speech mm. and those sounds can those are very simple sounds. So th they can be, for example, rounded or unrounded. They can be nasal, labial, glottal. It, it, it's 
some vibrations that our mouth creates. And, you know, the sound wave that is coming from our mouth still has some basic features of your basic voice and intonation. Yeah. But your mouth movement, you know, your sounds of speech add much more complexity to it. It, it, mm. it, it is like a ah, very, you know, finicky sound wave. And then like what we do is we, we take this sound wave that's coming out of your mouth and we would split it in small fragments. Mm. And then in those fragments, we would separate those parts that are to do with speech sounds and separate those parts that, like features that are to do with voice and intonation. Mm. And it gives us ability to alter both of them in parallel. So if we ah. wanted to, we could change also voices in, in real time, in parallel, or we can just do real time voice transformation, if you will, with this technology, like mm -hmm. actually very easy because changing voice is much simpler than changing accent. Yep. Uh, and, you know, then after the, the transformation happens, we recombine. And, and how we think about accents. So accent is, you know, like we have only a certain number of sound speech that human mouth can make. And those sounds are completely the same for any language or any dialect or any accent. Mm, How we perceive the speech really depends on the uh, prevalence of particular sounds and how we kind of like, you know, the order of how we group them. And th this, this is different for different accents and dialects. So the core technology is actually really can be applied to any language or any uh you know like any dialect mm -hmm. uh the the part where it's, it's specified is that we need to understand you know what this particular person is trying to say in which accent or language they talk to so we need some data uh, you know to, to recognize the speech so we need like to have a module that is recognizing that and then we can do conversion in a correct way yeah but like really like it's it's all about accents are mm. all about like the prevalence and the combination and like it, it's it's we all you know like actually the, this we all speak in a very similar way the human brain is designed in such a beautiful way that it understands like very strongly pays attention to to slight changes and, and you know like small variations and if you look you know like how speech is changing on a plot so like phonetic similarity or like sound similarity there are actually like really slight differences uh, that technology makes that for the human brain are perceived as very, very significant changes. So it, it comes up, you know, like for, for us, we have to do tests, obviously, on, on like algorithmical tests to have like data, like numbers on how we, we do it. But like we also do a lot of perceptual testing and, and those those uh, metrics are very different from like perceptual. It's, it's very like significant changes. Interesting. Well, I've never actually thought about this. So voice and intonation can't really, isn't something that you learn. It's just something that you generate based on your emotional uh, capacity and your genetics, right? The voice that you have is fairly genetic, you know, your lifestyle affects it, but you know, we know that it's not what uh, makes up your accent. And the accent is really how you have trained the muscles of your mouth and your face to convert that voice into speech, right? And so what you're really saying here is that the accent is the, the way that we have trained the muscles in our face, right? Yeah, and by it repetition, is, it is by repetition, by listening and by repetition and by trying to generate the same style, we convert, our, we put the voice from that's coming from our throat and our diaphragm through this mouthpiece, literally a mouthpiece, uh, which we have trained over time uh, like a muscle, which generates our accent. And so the problem that you're solving really is to separate the voice from the mouthpiece and like flip around different mouthpieces. Um, yeah, so, so it's a lot of, you know, like it's a lot of how our brain are actually trained in our original mother tongue. So, for yeah. example, in Polish, like there are lots of sounds of sh and sh and the ch, and like I have natural tendency when I speak other languages to create to group those sounds. So, like I have tendency to to kind of pronounce it to make my mouth a little different, yeah. where, where it actually doesn't belong in English as much as in Polish. And like every language has those particular ways. And like 
in, in many languages, like how we pronounce a or o is like very different. We stretch it more mm -hmm. or less, or like make it faster, emphasize and de-emphasize. So it's it's it really our brains are geared towards our mother tongue always, and yeah. we only can learn like very like native like pronunciation to a particular age somewhere in teenagehood most people lose this opportunity ability to learn accents like, in a native like capacity mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. our brains just mature and move on from that and like you, you just kind of stuck with like what you have as your like default way of and then you you see sometimes accent training you see like people are like the the, the you have to like flatten your heart to <laughs> exactly what you're saying like you have to make particular like movement to create the sound in a in a way that is prescribed by a different accent or different language yeah i remember like uh the first time um i i had uh, a polish friend and uh, she taught me one word in polish which is uh i'm gonna probably butcher this but uh Stodetska do Zambuf, right? This is great. The... You, did, you did it very well. It's toothbrush, yeah. yeah toothbrush. <laughs> and I struggled with this for like two hours, like to just generate these sounds, like Stodetska do Zambuf. And then she told mm -hmm. me, oh, it actually just means toothbrush. <laughs> so it <laughs> took me like two hours to learn to pronounce. And I had noticed, and I told her some things in Hindi and she couldn't pronounce them. So I felt like, okay, we are, now we're even, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, but it totally it's makes sense. Dark. Like the, the way we train our facial muscles using our mother tongue has a direct effect on what kind of things we can pronounce and not pronounce or pronounce with difficulty in a different language, right? So this this makes a lot of sense. Let's switch gears a little bit here and uh, let's talk about your go-to-market strategy and your fundraising journey because, like you said, we said you are a startup. How did that strategy evolve for you? So like I I want to start with saying that there is nothing simple about startup and the, if you if you feel like a, being a founder you have to just love it and you have to love your your problem that you're solving and you have to love your uh, team and your work uh, because like there is nothing easy about it anywhere you touch it so you know we started with um, we started with the accent problem we were solving and along the way as we went went on we we created this amazing technology that could do so much more okay. that we can use to change people's voices in real time and we can also you know re remove noise from recordings uh, we can emphasize particular parts we can also do speech analytics um mm. so you know like also we gather data so we can be a data company and then our like our sales vision our monetization vision evolved from um only being like accent conversion to actually being a company f focused on selling to software companies and developer community mm -hmm. to help them create delightful speech experiences in their products. Mm. And, you know, like there is very little right now available to improve speech experiences in, in products that exist today. Mm -hmm. So there is very little to improve human to human communication. And there is almost nothing to improve human to technology communication. You mm -hmm. know, word is the easiest way for people to convey complex ideas, yet communicating with technology, we rely on clicks and buttons. And this is very unnatural and, and, and bad for us. Mm -hmm. So we, we could be so much more comfortable as people using spoken word. But then, you know, like, so, so the vision evolved and our, we want to provide developers and software companies with SDKs, with software development kits that mm -hmm. uh, that improve those experiences. Because our product is so new and un unknown, like we have to educate people that such product exists. And we also have to have very strong metrics to show for our product improving um, yeah. intelligibility and, and saving time for people. So right now with the first initial rollout, we're gonna roll out accent transformation and we're gonna we're gonna roll it out as app so so we can get like good metrics and we can get testing. And then we're gonna roll it out as SDK uh, in, in six or eight months or so. 
from now. Mm-hmm. Um, we have design partners. We actually have customers, and we, they gave us comp- big requirements what we need to meet in terms of quality and, and standards. Mm-hmm. And we're building alongside those requirements, and then we, we're going to roll out the product so we can start testing it in real life environment and get feedback from users and metrics and improve upon what we're doing. But yeah, like we have, I'm not going to name companies, but uh, we have three very big companies. Uh, really interested in adding this to their tech stack. Um, so, mm-hmm. so that's, that's, that's kind of like the rollout strategy. And then we're going to build on this. So we're going to do product led growth, yeah. uh, as, as the company origin. So like based on feedback from users, based on what is useful, we're going to, uh, grow some branches of this business mm-hmm. and, and grow other branches, maybe less or maybe later, but like, yeah, it's, it's going to be a constant conversation between us and, and between the market, between the user. Interesting. This is what I hope for, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think this this was a really good VC pitch, you know, because I because any investor listening to this would go like, "Wow, that's a lot of you know potential. That's a lot of big market, you know, that you yeah. gonna capture, you know, like a large addressable market and all that thing." So uh, it's a good yeah. story, and it makes it's a sensible story. It's not like uh, you know, of course, yeah. No. Once you start with this problem, you generate the IP which can you know, help you go after other markets down the line. So you just have to start with one cornerstone problem, which in our case happens yeah. to be uh, accent conversion. But you mentioned, yeah, that, sorry, go ahead. Uh-huh. No, the, uh, I wanted to say quickly, quick words about market size and fundraising. So the market size for this is $174 billion. And like some of this would come from uh, teleconferencing market and like uh, contact center market, also voice gaming is really big and like, uh, you know, like real uh, live streaming and uh, smart devices, where it's yeah, activated smart devices. All of that, yeah. Yeah, and we don't even take into consideration metaverse and web free because th- those revenues are hard to assess. So we don't have like numbers, but those those verticals will grow definitely opportunities for monetization. And then to fundraising, like, hey, if you're a founder, your fundraising is never done. So you're always fundraising. We're always fundraising, <laughs> like always looking for investors, always looking for good connections, always looking for customers. So like th- this is ongoing. And this never, like, there's no, there are no breaks from that. Yeah. One thing, one thing that you mentioned uh, in passing, but I, it hit me for a second was that you talked about setting the right metrics. So what are the metrics that you target and how do you measure your company by? Well, you know, like, because I told you we have like lots of parts to the technology. So like, yeah. you know, like we measure different things. So for those modules that use, AI, we always measure loss function and we look at like, what is the loss function and like how it's, it's, it relates to, you know, to, to the bottom line performance. Uh, we're looking at, when we look at the holistically at the solution, yeah. we look at audio quality. So like the audio degradation, because the audio is heavy pros- processed. So mm. there is some audio okay. degradation and like, we definitely need to improve on that metric because the audio degradation is still like much more significant like much heavier than we want to have. So like that, mm-hmm. that's like a really important metric for us. And then we have our own metrics that we developed. So one is accentedness, we measure accentedness. Mm. Uh, and we, that is we measure overall intelligence. Just tell us a little, t- tell us a little bit about like, like a one minute uh, quick description of what accentedness means. Yeah, so like actually like it's it's quite straightforward. So we measure using using mechanical torque. So like we, we play recording for the person and I think it's on on a scale from zero to nine. Uh like a zero oh, is like no accent and nine is like very heavy accent. Like how do you like what is what would you rate this recording? And you play like a mix of recordings where you play like different accents. So like we you also you also have questions like like very simple yes or no questions. So like you you can play mm, recording and say like, is this in like accent A or this is like a non-accent A? So like, this is like accent A or this is foreign accent. Like, what is this? So put it in oh, one okay. bucket or another bucket. So then you kind of like combine those metrics coming, like which bucket the recording is in. And then like, you know, like how accented, like on a scale from, zero to nine like how heavy the accent is if you will so yeah like interesting that's like i know it's not like super like 
groundbreaking. <laughs> but oh, you have to great, measure no, somehow. Like, yeah. Why I love this story? Why I love this particular story, and I'm glad I asked this question is because, you know, and this is for the audience. When you're building an AI product, you're not, you know, you can use a lot of the metrics. You can use a lot of the techniques that other people building non AI products use as their metrics, right? You can combine both worlds. It's not like everything that you chase has to be in the form of a mathematical equation in a research paper that your loss function has to be something like very mathematical, very uh, signal processy or whatever you can use. Um, you know, this is the, it opens up your creativity. Like how do you find, you know, how do you combine traditional software development and product management methods? And you combine those with deep learning research to ch choose, creative new uh, loss functions, creative new algorithms uh, to optimize upon, right? Um, yeah. So and that's, I, I think, like, the real lesson here. Yeah, I would say like, hey, like if you're building a product for people to use or enterprises to use, like you are better use some like, non-mathematical ways of measuring, like you better use some perceptual assessment of it or like mm, practical yeah. assessment, give it to users to test somehow, like give like human feedback, not, not machine feedback, because at the end of the day, unless you're building something for machines to use, then like you're, you're best with machine metrics, but if it's like human user in, is involved, like you absolutely better use human feedback before you evaluate your solution. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ghana and, uh, to the audience, if you want to find them to buy their, uh, to buy from them or to invest in them, um, either way, or, you know, contact or them in collaborate. general yeah, or to <laughs> collaborate or to yeah. work for them. Uh, yeah. their, I think their website is sayso.ai. So S A Y S O dot A I. Um, and, uh, yeah, as they say, they're looking for, they're always fundraising. They're looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, thank you so much Ghana for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Aman. And I really appreciate the time and I'm glad it was interesting and curious. I, 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 I'm glad when I can, you know, make people curious about technology. I, I love technology. Also for any uh, female listeners there, um, yeah, technology is so cool uh, and you can do it. Absolutely. You can do it and you can lead teams. Uh, you can lead my, my team is, is right now completely male. So we're actually looking for more diversity uh, on the team. Uh, so keep that in mind. Like uh, absolutely as a female founder, you can lead male teams very successfully. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I love that as well. Like, you know, like, uh, so this is a female founder telling you, Hey, don't worry. Like, even if you're in a deep tech field and you're going to be surrounded by dudes, like just go for it, you know, uh, uh yeah, like, nothing's it, stopping it, you. You absolutely, yes, absolutely go for it and you dare to do it. You can do it. If, if this is something you feel like doing, just go for it. Awesome. Yeah.